Hello, and thank you for joining us for the next episode of the Patent Analytics webinar series. Today's presentation will cover using blue ocean maps to identify open spaces in the patent landscape. A webinar recording and the slides will be emailed to all registrants. Please feel free to enter any questions using the Q&A feature in the Zoom menu. And with that, I'll turn things over to Thomas. All right, thanks, Michelle. And welcome everybody to episode six here on patent analytics uh, in this series. Uh, I'm excited to be here with uh, our analytics expert extraordinaire, Mark Stignani. Um, uh, Steve Lundberg will be, uh, will be joining um, momentarily along this presentation. Uh, if you've turned into earlier episodes in this series or previous webinars, maybe some talks, podcasts, those, uh, you know the knowledge base that Mark is going to be bringing along to this discussion. Uh, he and I have talked uh, on this topic and others a number of times in the past. Um, Mark is the former chief patent counsel with, uh, from Thompson. Uh, it's now the analytics chair with the Schweigman firm. And Really looking forward to this episode, Mark. Uh, like I mentioned, you've had, you and I have discussed this one uh, extensively in the past. Um, so I think this is going to be a fun one to get into. Uh, okay, let's jump into the next slide. So we're going to be taking a look at uh, patent free space analysis or uh, blue ocean analytics. I like to think about this type of event analysis in two categories. Uh, one is kind of more company focused, figuring out where are there gaps in my portfolio. Um, this might have more of a comparative element, looking into competitors to identify where a portfolio is strong and where it's weak across different technologies. But the second kind of broader uh, uh, look, which is falls really under this blue ocean type of heading um, is identifying these open untapped areas in a broader technology field and this is maybe a little bit less about comparing with the competition and more of a view of an entire landscape uh, all right next slide so this is going to be uh, essentially the agenda for today we're going to go into specific methods for what we call uh, blue and red ocean analysis. Uh, I know Mark is gonna go into a little bit on those, on those terms. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, mapping within those categories. Uh, we're gonna identify when each of these is most useful, uh, what insights can be gleaned, and maybe most importantly, what actions can be driven from that insight. And finally, we'll uh, take a look at some of the tools that can be used for doing this analysis, which is always important. So the question to be answered here really is around finding new areas for IP development and patent protection. Uh, this includes understanding various innovation or application alternatives, and also where there may be fewer let's say obstacles to patent protection or technology development, right? And the use cases here are gonna be determining what areas may be ripe for R&D investment. Uh, this provides a, a data point that can go alongside the business and market analysis for determining risk, uh, looking at reward and, and value in a new area. Of course, this is, this is applicable when planning new products, uh, feature developments, and you know, even, even looking backwards at missed opportunities, these can be useful for improving future processes and development analyses by taking a look at uh, what happened in the past and uh, where there were potential misses. Uh, okay. If I could jump in here, Tom. Yeah, know, yeah, please, yeah, please. There's, you know, a lot of this is, this is kind of the bread and butter of an in-house counsel is kind of understanding what is 
covered up with a patent portfolio and was not covered with a patent portfolio. And for those who've been in-house uh, for a number of years, you realize that there's just not enough time in the day to do a lot of this, uh, you know, analytically. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we try to do here is we're building these use cases out is to you know, assist our clients in understanding, you know, uh, these types of features in a fairly easy to understand graphical manner that helps them uh, interact and, and also partner with their development teams and their, their marketing teams as well. So uh, one of the things that we're really focused on here when we're helping our clients is really, is this a place that you can make money? And uh, you know, it sounds very, you know, more businessy than patenty, but uh, I find it to be a really helpful way to sell this type of analytics to a, uh, you know, a client's you know, you know, business team because in many cases they're just trying to figure out where, where the world changes and where, where, what changes it can they make with their existing you know, product bag uh, with kind of the minimum amount, amount of investment as you're going forward. Um, yeah, Mark, I couldn't agree more with that uh, as, from an in-house perspective. There's, there's a lot of activities when you're in-house that are kind of, I don't know, what, what I've called like passive uh, IP activity where I'm maintaining the portfolio, we're reacting to uh, inventions that are being submitted, uh, et cetera, that are very important. Um, and then something like this is maybe more of a active or proactive uh, approach where the IP function is uh, going into and providing benefit uh, to, uh, to the business uh, side of things. Um, and if you, I think it's a winning combination if you have both of those within your in-house department. You tend to be a, a valuable business partner as well as, you know, kind of doing the prescribed expected duties of a, an IP department. And it's also the number one way if you're in-house to be invited to the rest of the meetings uh, at the earliest possible Ex amount of time. Ex exactly. Yeah, I, the biggest lesson I learned in-house was be helpful and useful and, and uh, you know, know what you're talking about before you get to the meeting. That doesn't seem too complicated, right? No, not a bit, not a bit. So uh, what I do here is I'll just jump to the next slide. Uh, also, uh, for those listening, we do take questions. Uh, please use the question and answer uh, tab on Zoom here. Uh, we'd like to try to take those in, uh, in, in sequence as best we can. Uh, so ask them and we'll try to answer them in sequence on the slide. Uh, also, both of us are readily available through our websites and you have questions you don't feel comfortable asking here. Uh, I have a habit of you know, emailing and setting up meetings after the, the, the uh, webinar to, to cover those with you. So, Let's talk about blue oceans, red oceans, and, and why we aren't calling this you know, white space analysis. Uh, first of all, I've never liked the term white space analysis. It's something that means a thousand and one things to uh, you know, people in patent analytics. Uh, my best analogy to white space analysis is white noise. So uh, it doesn't really come in as useful. Uh, I found the red ocean, blue ocean uh, metaphor much more useful, and it's not mine. As you can see at the top right now, some down below, uh, you know, Chen Kim and Rene Marvogin. Um, apologies for the pronunciation. Uh, came up with this, and you know, the whole the whole metaphor is that red oceans are where everyone is competing today and doing your best to make money and trying to find uh, example. And, and basically, this is blood in the water. Uh, the metaphor. So you know, sorry for the icky metaphor, but. Uh, you know, they're trying their best to compete on a known marketplace. A uh, blue ocean strategy is uh, driving yourself into other marketplaces that are, are less competitive uh, and give you more opportunity for true innovation. Now, it could be, you know, simply a, uh, a, a tweak to a process or a tweak to uh, a product or composition you're making that has an entirely unexpected use. That's pretty well known. Uh, it, the hard part about Blue Ocean is when your marketing department says, we're going to sell like, you know, we're going to sell this like crazy. And then they give you the construct of what they're going to sell. And then it gets turned back to the technologist or the, the, the patent council to figure out how to get there. Now, patents are uniquely 
suited for analysis in this area because in a lot of cases, uh, patents disclose a lot more than the marketing department will ever put out there, or it also you know cover things that generally aren't published, uh, even though you know the academic world does publish a, a great deal of things in conjunction with patenting. So uh, one of the unique places to be in the patent analytics area is to be able to you know look at you know the patent literature and the non-patent literature and the competitive marketing. Uh, literature and start to identify what is already disclosed. Uh, another hard part about this is really what you're being asked to do by uh, your business partner is to define where something doesn't exist. So it's the art of defining what isn't there, which uh, is is what they're really seeking you, you haven't hoping you're going to find for them. And as anyone knows, trying to find something that, that you don't have a definition of is incredibly difficult. And so what we try to do is approximate uh, that by understanding, um, first of all, what a company cares about, uh, the list of assets they want to bring to bear, and then doing, you know, in essence, uh, you know, a, a bit of an organized thinking around what do they care about and what they don't care about. So uh, it's so what we're truly trying to do in the Blue Ocean Strategy is to start mapping out uh, what has been previously disclosed in areas they care about, and then identifying the lack of disclosure in something that they think is important. Uh, next slide, please. So the caveat here is, you know, red oceans are generally a profitable market space. Uh, you know, given the blue ocean metaphor, since you're defining something as nothing you may not immediately equal revenue if you find something that is worth pursuing. Um, as also, you know, patents are not everything, the end all, the be all for this analysis. I, I find that you know, looking through, especially the scholarly literature, things that are peer reviewed, um, provide an incredible amount of disclosure and detail where a patent may have omitted that or simply referred to it. So I try to look at the NPL references in patents uh, and also do my external search as I'm going through that. Uh, for any of the in-house people thinking that this is something they want to do, uh, you know, please, please work really hard at avoiding the fishing expedition because, uh, you know, I like the term boiling the ocean because, you know, you want to see what's underneath it. Uh, in many cases, the, the, the statement by marketing is overly broad as to what you really want to search. You have to distill that down into a series of features or functions or processes that uh, you can search uh, more ex inexpensively on, and how can you transform the, the, your existing place, uh, and your existing marketplace, into something new? Uh, in the rare case that you're looking to jump into an entirely different marketplace, uh, we found it's actually useful to, you know, uh, do a parallel analysis on, on those who are doing stuff in that marketplace and, and see if they have a make versus buy. A discussion with your your business people as well, as it uh, it may be you know, ultimately cheaper to you know buy something that transforms you rather than to you know, attempt to or organically transform you. So uh, again, uh, my caveats on blue ocean tend to be uh, you know work on keeping your costs constrained uh, and 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 be methodical about how you go forward with it. Um, and next slide. So here's my biggest um, you know, problem with the commercial solutions out there for blue ocean maps. Uh, this in many cases, in many commu uh, commercial providers uh, constitutes their white space map. And it, it's really, a, you know, it's called a spatial vector or a support vector machine uh, mapping where you're taking noun uh, doublets and triplets and uh, in some cases you know, quadruplets and measuring the, the distance between them in sentences. And I find these things, you know, the, whereas they're pretty, they're absolutely unexplainable. And if you look underneath the, the, uh, the picture to the analytics underneath, uh, you know, in many cases, the, 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 they'll be sold as, oh, the valleys are where there's, you know, white space or blue oceans or whatever they sell it as. And it's just simply not true when you look under it. 
it's just the, the absence of a, a vector distance. Uh, they're very pretty. You know, it doesn't also quantify what is disclosed. Uh, you may have these, you know, three word uh, tuples together. Uh, and, you know, you might think there's something there to look at, but when you get in and actually have to read the disclosure itself, it may be entirely unrelated to what you're looking at. Uh, you know, activity wearable treatment uh, could be something as simple as a, uh, something that might be on a wristwatch. It also might be something on a EKG. And in, depending on what you're looking at, it, 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 it does, doesn't show anything easily. Um, for those who, you know, understand uh, you know, term frequency and verse document frequency, k-means clustering or force direct replacement, which are the algorithms they use to generate this. Uh, you know, sure, they, they, you might be able to explain it with with uh, with some ease, but it's difficult to show this map and say well, this means X to a C-suite executive who's going to make a decision whether he's going to spend money or she's going to spend money on your particular project or not. So uh, I just avoid these like the plague and, and don't find them at all helpful in, in explaining what the landscape uh, and the opportunities are in a particular grouping of, of, of uh, patent materials. Tom, did you have some comments, sir? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I tend to agree with that. I've, I've always liked the way these looked um, and tried to use them and haven't been able to. Um, and ultimately, what I end up coming down to is if I'm looking at a technology space and I'm looking at my portfolio, uh, I have more success with simple categorizations um, across both, which then can be uh, visualized with bar charts. Um, and uh, have been able to make uh, much more use out of an analysis uh, like that because now I've got categories that apply to my products and I can see peaks and valleys. Um, maybe that was the wrong term to use <laughs> given the picture, but I can see that, you know, strengths and weaknesses, highs and lows in the portfolio compared to the landscape uh, with things that I've defined and I know are applicable to my portfolio or applicable to what I'm trying to analyze. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, no, I, I and I, I put the, I put the link up there for those who want to read more on it. Um, you know, it's put up by another, you know, uh, analytics expert who has lots of opinions. Is, and then, so I encourage you if, you, if this is something you really want to explore more deeply, please go to the link. Uh, I just don't find them useful. So uh, next slide. So let's start with the fundamentals. Uh, you know, for my most successful engagements on this, uh, I, I've always had the, uh, the benefit of sitting with R&D and marketing uh, at the very, very beginning. This is, you know, you don't do blue ocean analysis uh, three weeks before launch because it's gonna come up with you know, lots of things that you need to you know, stop yourself on. So uh, in the R&D and marketing people are essential, not just nice to haves, because what you're trying to do there is glean out of them as they're going through what the product is, you know, they're thinking about doing or what the process they're thinking of making. You have to glean out of them, well, what technical approaches do you think are most useful? Uh, also, you know, what is your selling point going to be? Is your selling point going to be that it doesn't use, you know, hydrocarbons, or is it a is it going to be uh, that it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, you know cost you an arm and a leg to run you know work in this marketplace, or is it going to be more healthy? So that is going to start you with the high level definition of of how you're thinking about searching for this and how you care to organize yourself. We're going to present some some structural thoughts as we go through this. Um, also. Equally as important here is to, at the earliest onset, establish what you don't care about. Because if you have, uh, if, you're, if you have to look at everything uh, under the sun that makes, uh, you know, that's going to be related to this thing and try to understand it, you know, that's back to boiling the ocean. And I don't care how good of an analytics person you are and how good of an attorney you are, you're going to cost an awful lot of money 
uh, to look at everything and, and make some judgment about it. Because you know, really what you're trying to do is uh, you know, find out what, in, what is the most cost effective way to get to an answer here. And I like using taxonomies, uh, you know, hierarchical taxonomies in my case, uh, to, to help work with the technology group or the marketing group and say, well, you know, is this, is this what you're going to sell or is this feature what you're going to sell? Says, so once you start putting that, you know, kind of tree structure together and start looking at what is, what is really valued by the teams, that's where you need to put your money and your investment in to review. So, and it's always going to be an iterative process. You, you should think about, you know, the first iteration, kind of this defining landscape or FTO wise, the world that you live in uh, versus you know, the, the world that you don't live in. And the world you don't live in is where you would start looking for blue ocean. Uh, and then you start knocking things away with don't cares, uh, because if you don't care about something, don't investigate it. Uh, and go down that road first so that you give the, the, the R&D group and the marketing group what they think is important based upon what they say is important. Uh, Mark, when you, think, about, when you talk about don't cares, are you talking, are, are these like constraints given by the marketing or business groups or? It can be, it's really, you know, let's, let's you know, I'm gonna engage in a, 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 a hypothetical about beer making. Using sure, sure. Biotech organizations. So, uh, you know, one of the, you know, we talk about in the, in the organization there, you might think about, well, do I care about organisms that just produce alcohol, uh, you know, that aren't being used in the marketplace? Or do I care about organisms that I can manipulate to create certain flavors, tastes, and things there? So, if it's just simply to produce alcohol, uh, those, that's a don't care item. You simply want to move down the, the structure and, and narrow narrow the, the focus to maybe I want alcohol uh, produced by organisms that uh, I can also modify and use them to create flavors and textures uh, or you know, just alcohol is not a texture but you know flavors and, and other things in the alcohol that uh, that you care and you can make money at it. so uh, you, you, you starting at a level of you know all, all organisms that create alcohol might be a don't care situation got it so, so it's kind of like a N not interesting enough. Let's, yes, it, it's let's not dig in deeper. It's too big. I mean, and it, so it's like taking a magnifying glass to, you know, with some laser focus to what you think you're going to produce. Because if mm -hmm. you don't think you're going to produce something, um, why are you investing the time in looking at it? Uh, and, and so this is this is this is how I get to the you know question of where do I look for where, where are the empty spaces I need to look into. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's all about finding an empty space. Oh, and that's, I mean, e even some of, some of the times that I've seen, you know, the, these processes will start with almost no data, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a marketing group or a product group will say, we're looking to get into this area. Uh, we want to go into the XYZ space. Okay, where can we play? Where can we develop and protect our technology where, where other players aren't? Exactly. All right, IP group, go tell me. Go tell me where there's not patents. <laughs> it's, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's open ended, um, but this iterative, iterative process is, you know, one of the ways that you can get there. And one of the things that I might add too is, and I think you brought this up on an earlier slide, is you can take a look at some of the maybe adjacent technology areas and look at the applications that exist there and then determine in the particular technology space that you're looking at, do those exist? Is it plausible they could exist? Is, is there patent protection? Is, you know, is there coverage? Do competitors have stakes applying application X in technology Y? Um, and, you know, kind of it makes you branch out a little bit beyond the technology space that you're looking at in particular, but it helps kind of open up maybe the possibilities of where things could be. And that's, you know, that's one of the things you're trying to get at, right? What's, mm -hmm. where could things be? Um, uh, which is, which is difficult without some, some additional process. Exactly right. And, and one of the things that you'll find, as you know, you know, some of the most successful blue ocean analyses that I've worked on 
uh, we've gone down a certain set of trees and then uh, about oh, three quarters of the way down into the don't care discussion, they suddenly have a, a, you know, a brainstorm or, a, or, or, or an incentive uh, on that. You know, the, uh, you know, you can find the other, the other way to take it. You find, you find an entirely different tree of inquiry. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so we find that fires off uh, the, uh, the, the technology people, especially if you can get them into an ideation mode. Uh, and so uh, we do have a, a question in, in or a commentary in from one of our, uh, our, our guests here. Uh, it said, the tough part of having IP drive research. In my biotech experience, scientists loathe to change direction. And that's true. <laughs> you know, if if you're not uh, if you're not in house, you have a lot harder time convincing a scientist that uh, they haven't invented the, the best thing since sliced bread. But you know, if you're working with uh, you know either working in house or you're working with in house people, one of the things that they continually get asked are you know by the marketing group how how to take something north or south uh, and make more you know more revenue based upon you know some of an innovation. And the good news is is that most companies and corporations do not innovate in entirely new buckets without you know extensive work most of their innovation goes into five minutes upstream and five minutes downstream innovation and so what you can do when you're working with scientists in that respect is to take the scientific viewpoint and start asking uh, you know there's a there's a there's a questioning me methodology the russians brought forward called triz Mm -hmm. which is basically trying to force the idea open further. And you start asking these sets, series of open-ended questions to your scientists. Well, could it do this? And if that happens, then could it do this? So, uh, you know, the tree works, you can work into a much more narrowing focus in your, in your, in your ontology, but then in the same, you know, in the same breath, you may see uh, relationships or ask the scientists or technologists to ask for relationships could you do this? And, and, and more times than not, I mean, I've had a couple of these situations where, you know, I walk in with, you know, my you know, you know, analyses and say, here's the, here's where there's disclosure, no disclosure, and here's the types of disclosure to go in there. And then uh, that will trigger uh, one of the, one or more of the in, in, inventors or engineers and scientists, they will they'll start you know, their own little argument. And that drives, you know, disclosures way up. I mean, I've had, I've had a, a 45 minute session Looking at blue ocean discussions generate 2025 20, disclosures just in that in that time frame alone. So it can mm -hmm. be very very fertile if it's done in the right spirit. And uh, you know it is if you have a scientist who thinks that you know you know the, the patent attorney is the most ignorant person in the room, and we are. Uh, but they're, if they're not willing to listen to you, yes, then then that's difficult. But if the, yeah. if, you, if it's driven cross uh, cross discipline, where you've got the R and G team leader, you've got the marketing person, and you have, you know, four or five other people are going to be involved in implementation. It changes that metaphor. So uh, good question. It's uh, it, it, how do you change human nature? You know, you know and sometimes it's just like arguing with people on Facebook. It just doesn't work. But anyway, <laughs> but nonetheless, avoid the fishing expedition. I mean, uh, Tom, did you have anything else to say here? Or we can... No, that, that, was, that was good. Thanks. All right, let's, let's move to the next slide. So how deep should I go? And I'll just before I start introducing the the beer example, because you know the more high level 10,000, 30,000, 50,000 foot view you take, the more expensive it's going to be to do your analyses. Uh, you know what we tend to do is you know, you know we try to talk people off the top tier and bring them down at least to the sub level tier in this respect, where you know. You know, our, our preference is to start, you know, maybe two or three levels down. So, you know, each level has its pros and cons. I mean, if you really want a complete answer and you want to boil the ocean and you want to pay for it, we are happy, very, very happy to, to do that. But in, in most companies that I've worked with or in, it doesn't happen. They're really looking, to, what they're really looking for is help me find another or, you know, you know, order of magnitude revenue that I can you know, benefit from it by investing in this R&D. Mm -hmm. And to that level, it's a much different question and it's much different uh, to, to respond to. So, uh, you know, yeah. Mark, it, yeah. it, what comes to mind when you talk about it that way and the way that you've defined or the way that red and blue ocean have been defined is if you've read uh, Clay Christensen's 
like innovator dile innovators dilemma. Mm -hmm. We've got this idea of uh, incremental innovation and the disruptive innovation, right? Yeah. And the uh, the red ocean type of uh, developments, you know, are more of that mm -hmm. incremental. We know where we're going. Uh, blue, like you're saying, and what uh, these clients, companies, uh, etc., are after um, are something that is fundamentally different. Yeah, something that's that's innovative in in that respect. And if you study the various disruptors out there, it is in many cases it isn't really that different of technology, but it's a different method of how you deliver that technology. And so, you know, the disintermediation of, of existing chains of process, uh, mm -hmm. you know, even though they don't sound very blue oceany, they are extraordinary blue oceany. You can find, well, if I can get this to, you know, you know, think about how you know, companies like the ride sharing or the house sharing industry have they've just absolutely disintermediated a great number of clients from the hotel industry or the car rental industry or the taxi industry. Mm -hmm. So their blue oceans were actually, and you know, this is really, really key that everybody listen to this, is that you, you, your blue ocean may be something as simple as a process change uh, and, and how you deliver that to the end, the end user. So you know, it, it can be high and mighty and, and inc incredibly different, but you know, blue ocean can be as simple as, let's, let's, let's hand this off this way. So, yeah. yeah. So, which, which I think speaks to your iterative approach here mm -hmm. with the don't care levels because it's much more difficult to say, like, let's take this top level, right? Mm -hmm. Have a, a high level biotech organism, to a new high, uh, biotech organism to produce alcohol, right? That might be a very difficult endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you dig down, there may be some process change. There may be something that can be borrowed from another industry that hasn't been done that changes the way everything else works within that field. Um, but is, you know, after it's done, it seems kind of simple. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of, 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 you know, analogs that can be derived there. I mean, you know, if you ever look at, you know, commonality between patents and between the automotive industry and, and the cosmetics industry, you're, you're going to be, you know, absolutely amazed at how much in common they have, even right down to some of the materials used. So, um, yeah, it, it, the, the, the keeping a mind open for analog marketplaces uh, mm -hmm. is a, a, an essential item of doing this type of analytics. So let's jump to the next slide here, and and uh, we'll keep we'll keep chugging through here. So, so this is my idea of a simple taxonomy, as we've been talking before. And you know, generally, if you're looking at uh, red ocean versus you know blue ocean, anything that's kind of commercially used and patented uh, or things, that, you know, this is how you, the reds are don't cares. We get to the don't cares very quickly. So, when you're working with a uh, a set of clientele. In working with technologists, what you want to try to do is organize it in a way that they can say at a decision level, yes or no, we care about red, we don't care about. And the more don't cares you get to, if, they, if you don't think that biotech processes are going to you know, be the way you get there, uh, it's, just, it's all going to be bioorganism, then you've just cut half the tree off. And you know, then you can really start focusing on it. So you know, this is why I really push spending time iteratively up front before you even lift the, lift, the, lift the database to discover what the scientists are actually interested in, what the marketing people actually think they can sell, and how far they can take this to the next level. So, uh, so I, just, I use this as an example because it's a very easy way to uh, show how it breaks out. In many cases, when I'm presenting this to uh, clients, I will have patent counts uh, uh, in an area. Uh, you know, also I also have low uh, low disclosure as well, and uh, you know, just to kind of give them a sense of you know how 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 big is the hole we're digging here. So, anyway. so Mark, what you're saying in in that type of an example, you would have this high level blue ocean beer, and mm -hmm. then uh, off those first two um, uh, points in the taxonomy, 
bioorganisms that produce alcohol, you'd have a, a patent count to give an idea, what does this space look like? Yeah. Okay, this is 75,000 patents globally, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Biotech processes. Okay, that's, that's pretty broad, right? Yep. And say, okay, and then the, uh, the client or in, in internal or external uh, would mm -hmm. say, okay, uh, yeah, both of those are actually interesting to us right now. Let's dig in a little bit. Yeah. Um, let's, and in, ca in this case, you've, you've marked don't care, commercially used, patented. So take the things that you've identified as patented already. Let's move those to the, to the side. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I'm interested in what's not commercially used, let's say, in the bioorganisms area. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, well, there's two in this case, two, there's probably more um, yeah. levels, mm -hmm. uh, can also produce esters or don't produce esters. Well, okay, as the customer, then I say, look, let's not worry about the ones that don't produce esters. What do we have that does? And mm -hmm. that starts to, now you can go back and maybe do an additional search and see if there's anything that falls into that area. Mm -hmm. Maybe that helps you break it down even further. Am I kind of understanding your process correctly? You are understanding your process correctly because you know the quicker we find what we don't care about, uh, the more we can focus. So I mean, you know, to the degree that we want to find, you know, say, bio bioorganisms that that can be modified to produce alcohol, as well as flavors. I use the word esters for to for flavors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, that narrows it down pretty quickly. So in many times when I'm doing blue ocean analysis, my ocean starts at a different depth than most people are thinking they're going to, they need to start at. So I will start in uh, at a feature level or an attribute level rather than just try to boil the whole ocean and put it into play for everyone there to somehow work their way through. And then, you know, the biotech process, is, you know, you know it, it depends on the type of client. If the client's into producing stuff, uh, we may ignore the, you know, ignore the bioorganisms entirely and, and spend time down there looking at what processes are, uh, you know, we can we use it, modify or change the, the current organisms we already use. So again, that's, this, this helps structure the discussion. And the quicker you do this interactively and get things into don't care, this is where the, the, I guess, the magic starts, if you want to mm -hmm. refer to that, is where you, know, you, you start getting the scientists and the, and the marketing people saying, well, how about this? Can we do it this way? And so, yeah. and if you do your taxonomy correct, you can probably collapse in, or, or uh, expand your taxonomy to such areas. So that you really, you know, the question you're answering, is there enough disclosure in the space to warrant further investigation? Or is there no disclosure in space, and why not? Um, mm -hmm. And you know the why not part is really critical in in, in your analysis. So let's, well, let's jump. Go ahead. And that's and that's where you need the technical folks, the scientists yeah. in the room for the yes. discussion as well. Yeah, because they you know, and without, I, yeah, you can't do it without them. And before we leave this slide, I think it it might be important for us at this point to poll the audience to find out if you and I started a brewery, Blue Ocean Beer Co., who would buy from us? Yeah, would you, <laughs> would you have bioengineered hop flavored alcohol? That's right. So, <laughs> Does that sound interesting? There we go. There's yeah. the market research side. Yeah, I have absolutely no ability on that one to, to answer that question. <laughs> but uh, all right, well, well, they, well, people are formulating their, their, their investment strategies. Let's move on to the next <laughs> one. So, this is essentially, you know, this isn't much different than FTO work. I mean, really, as once you have your your taxonomy set up, you can, cer can certainly start searching back and forth uh, using all the various usual suspect analysis, backwards, forwards, citation, rejection data. Uh, I do use lots of clustering at this point because, especially when you're boiling through, uh, you know, large numbers of patents. I mean, a lot of times we'll start in the fifty. 60,000 foot level where you've got, you know, a thousand or more patents you've got to go through. So uh, I do save some time rather than reading, I do clustering. And mm -hmm. so clustering can help you get, you know, those counts out quickly. And you know, once you get those counts established, then that you take it, that's when you take it back to the, uh, the scientist group or the marketing group and say, yeah, well, here's, here's what we found so far before we do any disclosure analysis. 
here's what we have. And so also time-based criteria is really important because uh, you know, if we see if we see a trend in time that started in say 1965 and and was going on strong until 1980 and has just dropped off the face of the earth, there's a there's an open place for a question there. Did, did, did we simply stop, did we lose interest in that? Was it too hard? Were we missing something materially, uh, computationally or? Yeah, you know, an and enabling that, technology yeah. that didn't exist at the time. Exactly. Yeah. So, so time slicing is really, really important if you're going down the, the blue ocean analysis because if something was you know, kind of like it there and then it stopped and then you need to go in and ask why. Uh, so this is the fun part of this analysis is where, you know, you get to play little Sherlock Holmes and uh, Nancy Drew and get into there and, and be the uh, be the person to figure out, well, you know, there was a reason that they stopped. It just, and you know. For the audience's benefit, this happens more often than you think. Um, I, I mean, off the top of my head, I remember looking at uh, some great examples here, uh, solar technologies, Artificial intelligence, which is in its like third boom, um, mm -hmm. if you look back through history, um, 3D printing is another good example. And I mean, those are ones; those are all three uh, that are you know pretty prevalent today, but have been have had their peaks in technology development and also their valleys in the past. Um, so this time slicing piece uh, can provide some really interesting insights. And it's something that's often missed in the commercial solutions because they, the, uh, you know, the, the, I've seen a number of people try to time slice and uh, going back to the islands and oceans uh, analysis, uh, you know, they, they try to slice it in that way. And then you see these obscure peaks, you know, arise and drop in the time period. Uh, and unfortunately, that doesn't result, generally resolve itself in a good answer. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, sorry to still keep slamming on that, but it's, it, it, I just haven't found a good Good way to use it. Uh, next slide. And so, yeah, this is how we we do the first cut. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've largely covered this already. Uh, once you've done the first cut, uh, you know, plug it back into your 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 mind map or your flowchart or however you however you want to approach it and, and communicate this to your clients. Go back to them. And you know, put that forth as you know. Here's how this fits. Again, filter for don't cares, get them out of the way, uh, and then refine it. Uh, and this is, in many cases, your first cut is going to be off. You know, off by about six six clicks on the dial. It's going to be. You know, you're going to find it. You know, what you thought was probably not useful. Uh, that there's a lot of disclosure in areas that you thought you there would be nothing. And so this is the time after the first cut to, to really you know, push hard on the don't cares and get them knocked down. Um, next slide. So yeah, so we, you, know, you get these huge piles of patents and, and non-patent literature. And so again, if we, use, uh, we use a tool we developed here at Schwagman that uh, basically allows us to slice and dice both the specification of, of, of a patent, uh, uh, an NPL, a marketing brochure, you know, a, a lot of different things that, uh, you know, of relevant, relevant information. Because really what we're starting to look for here is we're not looking for what's in claims anymore versus what we did in an FTO. What we're really looking for is what has been disclosed. The, what's the level of disclosure? Is there high disclosure of this concept or low disclosure of this concept? So uh, we find it, Incredibly helpful to have something that maps that for us as we go through it and make that happen, and also then provide that same mapping to uh, the R and D team as we go into it. Um, yeah, one of the one of the biggest problems that I've seen in you know the other people's analysis is that you know if you if you if all the information is in the head of one person and you haven't done some sort of active mapping of it and put it out in the uh, in, in the space for people to interact with, um, you're never gonna fully vet the idea. And in this case, when you can put conceptual levels of, of disclosure out for the, for the scientific and the scientist or engineer, they can then make those, make those intellectual connections that you would never have made as, a, uh, as simply the IP comes. 
And so, uh, you know, if I haven't reiterated it hard enough, you got to partner with a technologist. If you get a, if you don't have a partnership with a technologist, uh, this is really, really hard. So, anyway, I'll get back off the bully pulpit here, and uh, we can go to the next slide. Unless Tom, you have something you want to say? Here. Okay. No, so, that, that, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, so, a, a lot of things that I have problems with, especially if you're in-house counsel, is to do a simple, you know, white space analysis. Uh, I like to push for, for white space or blue ocean analysis or whatever you want to call it to be evergreen in the sense that you do this and you use this as your map going forward for both your technology team and your, your in-house counsel team because then you can start to look at what the, what the landscape has, done, has been, uh, where you moved yourself. I mean, it's, it's basically like keeping a map of uh, your, your travels across the world. You know where you have been. So you don't go back there if you're looking for white space or blue ocean or anything that. So keep a track of that. You consider you know keeping it evergreen as in-house counsel. It allows you to answer more quickly what's in a space when uh, a marketing department comes and talks to you. Uh, again, everything is important in looking at this. NPL has sometimes more stuff in it, a, a, a blue ocean analysis than uh, you know, in many cases patents do. Uh, also, another thing I find interesting is that trademark goods descriptions have uh, a real, a real, you know, hidden benefit. If you're looking at the trademark goods descriptions, a lot of times there will be, you know, keywords in there that uh, you may not find in the NPL. Uh, of course, in the web and in these marketing uh, department uh, expressions, some other many times the marketing department will put something out, and they won't. Even, we will not have vetted it past the technology team. And so you'll start to see a distance between the, you know, the patents and the marketing brochures as well uh, as you're looking for evidence of use. Uh, Tom, you're going to say something? No, it's just agreeing. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, and another thing is glossary. Uh, the, the patents and, and uh, non patent literature all have uh, unique glossary depending on the industry that you're using and the uh, uh, you know, the types of terminology used by the various technologists. You know, so a biotech person may call something entirely different than someone in the others in, 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 in an analogous marketplace. So think, you know, think about my example between cosmetics and, and automotive uh, areas. I mean, you have uh, certain descriptive words of how a lacquer paint is applied uh, to a car, and you know, they might have an entirely different way of describing it for uh, nail polish. Uh, and, and so you have to come up with those core concepts uh, and the synonyms for those core concepts. Uh, you know, and then you think about, again, how your, your partnership works. Well, and, uh, and that's, so, that's an area where coming up with those synonyms, going more broad uh, is more useful in a blue ocean analysis like this than uh, say using the same technique that you would for a freedom to operate, exactly. right? So where where if you're working on automotive finishes it finishes, you're probably not going to be as concerned about cosmetics industry, mm -hmm. um, and so in that respect, not as concerned about the potential synonyms that would be used in that industry. When you're mm -hmm. looking at blue ocean. The, the value is about finding those synonyms in other industries. So, um, so it's not only do you not want to ignore it, but you actively want to look for those. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and also uh, another thing that, you know, once you get down into uh, things you do care about, you know, always review the, the file histories as well, because a lot of times you'll see utterances and disclosures in the file history uh, that may give you clues to where to go back up to. So, uh, next slide, please. So yeah, just build this whole slide out. So uh, so what we do is the tool we use, again, this is, if you see this looks similar to the slide we gave you on the FTO it is, uh, we basically like to break down, uh, you know, the noun pairs, noun truffles, you know, et cetera, in the specifications and the non-patent literature so that we can start to assign the synonyms. Uh, then we start to discover and review them for disclosure level rather than you know, an actual concept held 
uh, you know, for instance, you can mention something might be applied in a certain way. That's the level of disclosure. It certainly isn't enough for you to uh, you know, hang a new patent on, but it certainly gives you a clue as to where you might want to go next with that. And this all the parts of how do you combine your taxonomy, uh, which you had there, and, and put it into, into perspective as to how, what the level of disclosure is. And th this is all human work. It is all generally. human work. There is no but machine that does this. The idea is to, um, and I think what you're about to get to is improve the process yeah. to make the human work easier, right? Exactly. Exactly. And and because uh, it, it all comes down to, did they talk about it or did they not talk about it uh, in a particular disclosure? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to jump to the next slide, you know, we've seen this before, we do the same sort of mapping across uh, the, the concepts that we're looking for disclosure levels and we map them into an Excel spreadsheet. You know, next slide. We're coming up on the end here, so I'm just going to skip a few because this, you know, anybody wants to read it can read it. Yeah, but the idea that you're getting at in these slides, yeah. um, if, if I can summarize and you can sure. correct, <laughs> is that uh, you're, you're taking this information, you're breaking it down. I, I really like the head notes uh, analogy. Um, where you're, you're breaking something down to the basic components that are going to be useful for your business. And then to your earlier point, storing it so that mm -hmm. it's used useful in this analysis. But once you've done that once, it's useful in you know, the analysis that's going to come up again in three months or six months or two years. And if you're in-house counselor, it, 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 it slows down the repetition of work you have to do individually. So. Uh, I, I always felt that the benefit it saved me time to have these things handy that I could just add to it some other later point because you, know, mm -hmm. you know I used to be able to disclose you know tell people what I had in my patent portfolio on one hand at five five top you know top level topics and then each of those five topics had two or three subtopics below it so uh, I I am a great fan of simplifying how you think about things um, so yeah so the head notes just help me and say that these all carry a common concept. Mm -hmm. Next, uh, next slide. Again, spreadsheet use, uh, you know, use this there. In some cases, we will, you know, de-identify the concepts held in these taxonomies just so that we don't have the tech team have the full knowledge of who did what. It helps them, I think, be more objective. Uh, next slide. Yep, one more. So this is a type of a mapping format. As you can see down at the uh, lower level, I've cut out a portion of how we map out disclosure levels. So, uh, you know, if we pull up our, our taxonomy that you saw earlier and convert that into genus, species, subspecies, and sub-subspecies, you can see we get down to essentially where there's no density noted below or the existence in, or nothing exists at all in that area. Uh, and then, you know, we can very quickly at a glance see where things, where we need to do more work, where we need to maybe drill into some area. So in the case where we get uh, a particular you know, microorganism number two that produces alcohol and esters, uh, you know, there's only three of them there that has, you know, one, one we have one patent with a little bit of density on it, but then the rest of it's all in the green. Or, mm -hmm. you know, in the case of some of them, there's no mention of it at all. Um, and so we want to make sure that, you know, the absence of something in a matter may not be conclusory. conclusory. So, uh, so we'd like to try to put maps out where visually you can see very, very quickly where the opportunity may be. And then you, you get into uh, a very quick and pointed discussion about what, what you can take this to and where can you take it to next. So, you know, never stop at this level. I beg of you. Uh, because what, it, what this does then is it gives the scientists, the technologists, uh, the bioengineers, the next step, you know, well, let's see if you know, do, you know, this particular organism, yeah, but that doesn't do well in heat, so we, we, you know, we won't work in our processes. So you can quickly look at things and rediscover the don't cares, uh, because now you have a sense for what is not disclosed uh, on a subject that you care about. So we find this to be you know, pretty helpful. As you see, this is a extraction of, a, of some matters that I did you know, where I looked at you know, 40 different matters that described 
or 38 different matters that described uh, a particular thing. So it has, uh, you know, it has it has its usefulness. You know, this particular map generated 40 ideas that then turned into you know, somewhere among 30 patent applications. Uh, you know, after they went through all the processes. So it's it's highly effective when you get it right. It's highly useless if you don't. And so <laughs> there's, no, there's very little middle ground in, in blue ocean and, and analysis. So I, I, I certainly encourage people to put this in your arsenal, you know, make it aspect, you know, make it make it all an aspect of what you do as you're helping your product team and your your marketing team get to that, you know, capitalistic success factor. And, and being able to defend it with your own with your own IP. So uh, you know this is largely what I've got. Let's, let's go to the next slide and have a takeaway. Uh, the takeaways here: everything is nuanced here. This is not something machines can do yet. They try, but they're not capable. Uh, so go into this, look at your data consistencies, get your synonyms right, and uh, you know. Anybody tries to sell you this type of mapping without some sort of human review, I just don't see it being highly useful because you need this iteration, you need this uh, complex mm -hmm. interaction with between marketing, sales, R and D, and other uh, organizations. You so, know, I feel I feel like many times we talk about analytics and how to do them effectively, and there's this uh, kind of buzzkill sentiment that we have to <laughs> send along that is there's not a simple solution for a lot of these things uh and there's more work in iteration that's required you know by somebody with with some skill blue ocean is uh no different in fact in some ways uh it requires even more kind of expert human in the loop because you want not just your IP person, but your technical person and maybe your marketing person, you know, or people in that loop as well. And, and there's nothing but benefit but having those people in the loop because, you yeah. know, one of the things that I've always, always harped upon when I was in Alice is that the marketing people need to understand what we've got patented and mm -hmm. use it prospectively correctly in how they talk about the products at hand because you know the the uh the the notice aspect of good patents uh is really really beneficial for marketing groups you know you know i've i've heard i've seen it done a number of times where a marketing team will go in and say well this we have this patented technology and you can distinguish yourself simply by that statement uh when you're going up against somebody else who doesn't have a patent or you know maybe under the threat of you know assertion from you it goes along there so uh you know i think uh, you know in essence we got a minute or two left here i openly offer anyone who wants to continue this conversation with me uh to do so offline here's who we are we're great we're shrugging uh and uh you know to that end it, this is an ongoing set of scientific you know extemporization we have lots of tools that we're trying to to get better at this but again, it's 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 always going to end up being have the having the R and D person and have the marketing person. Anybody else uh, want a question? We'll wait for a couple minutes here. Otherwise, we will uh, say thank you so much. Thank you for your time, and uh, stay safe. And I am not seeing any questions come in, so thank you, everyone. Enjoy yep. your days. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.